And we're back with another episode. Get ready. Yeah, we sat down with Rabbi Zev Lef. Yes, that's the Rashiva who we were talking about in last week's episode at the yes. outro. And Rabbi Lef, you probably know, unfortunately, he's the most famous for recently, at least. For Not that unfortunate. But no, because there's I, so many other things exactly. You can be known that's for. what I mean. That's what but I mean. he was sitting by a soccer game with his kids and his grandkids. Football, was, if you're listening to this in uh, yeah, England, and he's learning. He's learning a safer, and the uh, and it, it, it like caused him to go very famous. Yeah, so <laughs> very we, very viral. He went very viral, and we ask him in this episode, uh, what was the deal with that? Like, yeah, why would, all about that story? Yeah, and you know, but Zev Lef was a rub in the greater Miami area for some ten years. Yes, before moving out to. Moshav Matasyahu. Which at the time was considered like wild what he's doing. Totally and, underdeveloped. And I personally got the chance to go there for Shabbos when I was uh, learning in yeshiva. And what an incredible, incredible community that he's built there. And we'll delve more into it in this episode. So sit back, relax, and have a coffee. If you like coffee. Unless you're flying spirit because they're not giving you coffee. You right. pay $18 for a ticket, they're not giving you coffee. Why are we hating on spirit all of a sudden? You think, this what's, podcast is not sponsored by Spirit What's Airlines? the chance someone's listening to this and they're like actually on Spirit? They're like, oh my gosh. Just make sure. It, 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 message us on Instagram if that actually this, happened. First of all, I can tell you there's no chance someone's listening to this on Spirit because there's no Wi-Fi on Spirit. Uh, they <laughs> downloaded it before, maybe. I don't know. All right. Enjoy this episode, guys. Welcome to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast where we talk to people who are... Meaningful. Yeah, that sounds good. We've been waiting a while for this one, just uh, couldn't really get this going because of COVID-19. But Baruch Hashem, we have Rabbi Zev Lef here, all the way from Moshav Matas Yahoo. He came in special to America just for us. No, I'm kidding. He came in to see family. Um, but uh, thanks for coming in and being here. Okay. It's my, my pleasure. Okay, great. So we have a lot to ask you. I know Nachi particularly has one specific question. He's <laughs> really burning to ask, so we'll, we'll get to that a little later. Um, but... Uh, could you take us back to, I guess, your child? What was your childhood like? Were you always okay. a rub? I was, no, I wasn't always a rub. I was born a baby. <laughs> okay, yeah. that's good. And I was born in the Bronx, New York, in Left's Hospital. No relationship, but that was the, okay. that's where I was born. And um, I grew up in the Bronx, New York, went to uh, PS71, I think it was, a public school. Um, my parents and grandparents, who we lived together in the same house, uh, moved to Miami when I was about uh, seven, eight years old. And um, I had gone to a Hebrew school in New York, in the Bronx, um, from the time I was uh, six, seven years old, after school. Um, I don't know why, but uh, the Rabbana Shalom gave me a tremendous uh, yearning for Yiddishkeit, even though my parents were basically traditional, we would call conservative traditional. Uh, they were not Shomer Shabbos per se, but my mother wouldn't wash clothes on Shabbos or, or uh, do other, other things like that. Um, and uh, they enrolled me in this uh, Orthodox uh, after-school Talmud Torah, and um, the year before that, I was too young to go, but my neighbor was a year older than me, and he taught me everything he learned there. So by the time I started the Hebrew school, I was already a year ahead of everybody there. And uh, uh, the, the, when we left, which was a year or two later, the Rebbe, who I tried to look up and find who this Rebbe was, but by the time I got the back to the Bronx when I was already in Cleveland and Tells after high school, uh, the Bronx was a war zone, mm -hmm. and that shul didn't exist anymore. In any case, so he uh, begged my parents that if we're moving to Miami, that they should enroll me in a yeshiva. And um, my parents basically agreed, and we came to Miami. They looked to enroll me in a yeshiva to the Hebrew Academy, where uh, Rabbi Gross was the principal. It just didn't work out. So they put me in an afternoon school again, a Hebrew school, in a conservative temple, which is the only 
uh, temple that existed in the area they lived in North Miami Beach, um, the people who ran it were basically from people. The rabbi was basically an Orthodox rabbi who was in a conservative temple for Parnassal reasons. He eventually went on later on to become a rabbi in a young Israel somewhere. Hmm. In any case, so uh, um, because I already had gone through everything they could possibly teach me in the Hebrew school, they met with me, the um, the heads of it, and they said that uh, we understand you want to be a rabbi because that's what I already had that yearning. And they said, we can't offer you anything here anymore. You have to go to the Hebrew Academy if you want to be a rabbi. And this was, I was eight years old at the time. Oh, gosh. And um, I envisioned going to the Hebrew Academy. It was like being locked somewhere in a prison, never seeing my parents again or whatever. <laughs> and um, uh, my parents, Baruch Hashem, were very open to the idea. Uh, they didn't have a lot of money, so the tuition was a problem. But the Academy gave me a, uh, a scholarship, and uh, I was enrolled there. Since I didn't know on the level of the Hebrew Academy, they put me in third grade for um, Hebrew and uh, fifth grade, I was in fifth grade at the time, for uh, secular studies. And um, I remember Rabbi Gross uh, took me to introduce me to the teacher in front of the class there, the third grade class, who were all two years younger than me. And the class was given in Hebrew. The only two words I knew in Hebrew were Cain and Lo. <laughs> and... Um, the teacher said something to me. I figured I have a 50-50 chance. And I said one of them, and the whole class burst out mm. laughing. In any case, uh, that next year, I um, caught up a little bit. They put me into the fifth grade in Hebrew and the sixth grade in secular studies. And uh, very, very fine teachers. I still was not 100% um, observant. Um, just as the level level of my family, basically. I remember the teacher in fifth grade asked, what's the difference between Yom Kippur and Shabbos? I said, well, um, Shabbos, you can turn on the lights and drive, and Yom Kippur, you can't. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, that's not, I guess that's not, <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound right. <laughs> and, um, and the next year I was in uh, seventh grade and seventh grade. I caught up, yeah, nice. and uh, the academy was very, very good to me. The teacher, my first Gemara teacher in the academy, was a Rabbi Stauber, who lives in this neighborhood now, and he was the rav of the shul in the young Israel, and which was in North Miami Beach, which already I had just started to attend, and um, uh, I used to learn with him. Uh, before davening, like at 5.30 in the morning, every morning. And then we would daven in the shul there, and he, he would take me to his house for breakfast and then drive me to school. So I got very close with him, and he was my first Gemara Rebbe. So he had a very big influence on me, as well as other people from the conservative temple who had a very big influence. By that time already, I was Shomer Shabbos. It was just before my bar mitzvah, like a year year or two before my bar mitzvah. And uh, by bar mitzvah, I had in the conservative temple. Um, that was the last Shabbos I was there. Um, they agreed to turn off the microphone for me. And uh, so they, they didn't have a mechitza, though, the, uh, oh. that, that much not. And uh, that was that. And then from then on, I was in the, uh, the young Israel where this Rabbi Stauber was the Rav. I feel like there's a Rabbi Stauber still in Florida. Rabbi Ephraim Stauber, is that? Yeah, yeah. Ephraim Stauber is his son. Son? Mm. And he's in he's in North Miami? He's in North Miami, which it could be. Okay, very cool. Were your parents um, hesitant that you were becoming more religious? Or not you... really, not really. They never, never gave me a problem. Mm. They uh, supported me very, very much in that. Um, and... Uh, no, they, and they were pretty much, uh, in the end, uh, when we, uh, uh, when I, be I became the rabbi of their shul, I became the rabbi of that young Israel years that's a, that's later. That's pretty cool, like which, starting off there, which, like right. not knowing the difference between Yom Kippur Shabbos and <laughs> leaving. Which shul is it? <laughs> shul, young Israel of Greater Miami. Young Israel of Greater Miami. Yes, yes. I, uh, I came back, uh, the whole story in itself, but I came back to Miami after I 
was already in Tells and uh, and got smicha, and I came back to be the rav of that young Israel that I grew up in, and my parents were balabatim of mine. Wow. Hmm. And uh, eventually they also became Shomer Shabbos, wow. and in, the, in their later years, <laughs> and they uh, moved to Eretz Israel after we moved wow. to follow us. Their, their parents, I feel like, followed in your footsteps. Right. <laughs> would you, yeah, would you say that you were Makar of your parents? Um, not actively, <laughs> but passively, yeah. So you, nice. you said there's a story. So yeah, you, you were in Florida, then you went to Tells, and right. if there's you know stuff you want to mention about Tells, you could, yeah. but then you went back to Florida. Yeah, what happened was I, I went through the uh, academy in, in uh, Miami, um, at sixth grade, when I had to go now in, in Miami, sixth grade was the end of elementary school, seventh grade was junior high school. When I finished elementary school, so the board of directors of the, um, of the academy decided that my parents were not paying enough tuition, and uh, they wanted them to pay more. And um, my parents just couldn't. So they said, well, if you can't pay more tuition, then... Your, your son can't be in the school anymore. And that's what it looked like they were telling me to go to public school. And um, I wrote a letter at that time to Rabbi Gross, which uh, uh, when he was nifter, they found it in his wallet. Wow. What was Rabbi Gross's reaction to your letter? The, letter, letter? the letter was that I, I have a letter in my, in my wallet. I carry around because Shragi Gross, his son, gave me a copy of the letter. Oh, wow. I was about, um, again, about 11 years old at the time, and I already wanted to be a rabbi. And I wrote Rabbi Gross. It wasn't his fault. It was the board of directors. I said, I have no feelings, no hard feelings against you or the board of directors. Um, if the Rabbanos wants me to be a rabbi, I'll be a rabbi one way or the other. And if not, not. And, um, and uh, that was basically the gist gist of the letter, right? I really understand, you know, your position, and I have no hard feelings, and that's... Um, uh, in any case, Rabbi Gross helped me get back into the academy. Um, uh, the conservative rabbi of the temple that my parents belonged to raised my tuition. The one that they asked, so I always had a tremendous akkor satov to him. And then I, from then I went through junior high school in the academy, and then on to the high school, it was Masifta High School, of the, which was the academy's high school. And then my rebellion in Masifta were two rebellion from Tells. And I got very, very close to them, uh, Rabbi uh, Avram Groner, all of Shalom, and Rabbi Moshe Mendel Simon, whom Baruch Hashem is should be well and um, because of them I decided I wanted to go to Tells originally I when I was younger the only place I knew of was Yeshiva University or Baltimore near Israel that's where both went but after I got close to these two Tells I decided that I wanted to go to Tells I ended up um, going there and uh, um, I, I went through many of the shiurim, uh, got married there, uh, be, uh, joined the kollel. I became the dormitory su supervisor in Tells. So we had our own apartment in the uh, f apartment for free and uh, a salary even. And I could learn there three shiurim. And eventually I started teaching in the Masifta there in, in Cleveland and in the girls' high school and in Yavna Seminary. Uh, along with learning in the kolo. And um, so I really was pretty much set there. Um, I was uh, a gvir. Right? Mm -hmm. I, I actually got a salary. Especially with that salary. salary right, right. Yeah. right. And uh, I had no reason to leave. I was, I was looking in Miami. We used to go back to Miami for Pesach. I was looking maybe to start another uh, yeshiva high school because I felt there was a need there. And I had a friend in Tells uh, also from Miami, that was going to do it with me. In any case, what happened was that uh, one Pesach, we were back in Miami, and uh, this was in the early 1970s. Yeah, yeah, the 1970s. And um, the rabbi of the shul, 
Um, this was where, after Rabbi Stauber, there were like two or three other rabbis. The rabbi of the shul, um, it was a mutual agreement, decided he's leaving the shul right before Pesach. And uh, he had arranged for some rabbi from South America to come and be an acting rabbi for Pesach. That act, acting rabbi never made it because his son got sick. And uh, heir of Pesach, they realized they have no rabbi for Pesach. So I was there, and I used to give shiurim in the shul or whatever, and I grew up in that shul since I was uh, nine, ten years old. So um, uh, they asked me, they said, look, we need somebody to sit on the bima in case something comes up and to give drushes. So could you do it for the first two days of Pesach? They didn't want to commit themselves to the end cause, <laughs> in case it was a disaster. <laughs> That's right. So um, I said, you know, I never was interested in being a a pulpit rabbi, but uh, it sounds interesting. uh, So I said, fine. I sat up in front, and I gave drushes both days, and it worked out very nicely. So they said, you know what, how about the last two days? So I did, and the last day of Pesach, they make an appeal, a Yisker appeal. And since I made the appeal, and all these people knew me since I'm eight years old, they gave twice as much money as they ever gave before. So the board of directors decided, hey, this is not a bad idea. <laughs> we just raised right? our salary right. for the next year, so it's here. So they, they met with me the last day of Pesach, and uh, they said, um, would you be interested in putting your name in for to be the Rav of the, of the shul? And my, in my mind, I said, there's no way in the world I ever want to be a pulpit rabbi. I have Baruch Hashem, uh, great arrangement entails. I have no reason to leave. And um, But these are people that I knew, you know, growing up. And I didn't want to hurt their feelings or make them feel like this is nothing I would be ever considered. So I said, look, I've got to think about it. And I've got to speak to my rebellion in tells. Let me think about it. Let me go back. And I'll, I'll write you a letter, you know, and let you know if I'm interested or not. And I figured I'd get back and write a nice letter that, you know, just not from me. I went back to Tells, and uh, I was very close to the Shiva of Gifter. And when I got back, I met with him, and I was telling him about the, the yeshiva, the high school that we're thinking of starting or whatever. And by the way, as a joke almost, I said they offered me to be the rabbi in the young Israel there or whatever, and uh, just as an aside. <laughs> two weeks later, I get a um, uh, call uh, in the base medrash, uh, somebody comes there and says the Rashiva wants to see you immediately in the in the Anhala room. Never go when the Rashiva wants to see you immediately. Yeah, so I yeah, like, oh. yeah. So I I went and I walk in. Rav Gifter says, "We've been thinking about it for the last two weeks, and we decided that you should put your name in to be the Rav in the Young Israel." There, he said. Um, uh, we Rosh Hashivas made a big mistake, and we didn't send our Talmidim to be Rabbonim in America. And had we done that, maybe America would look different. So you're going to be the first one. <laughs> We're sending you to Miami, and we think that's a good idea that you become a Rav. I was like flabbergasted. I told my wife, we would... but uh, look, I was very close with Ruth Gifter, and I trusted him. So, but I figured, look, I'll put my name in. There's other people there who are much, much more um, fit, befitting for young Israel. And um, I won't get in, and I, I at least did what Ruth Gifter said and finished. So I told, I called them, and I told them that, you know, I'm interested, and I'll put my name in. And uh, they, they invited me for a proba on Shavuos. So I went to Miami for Shavuos, and Motsoi Shvuas, they had a, um, a, a shul meeting where they could ask me any, anything they wanted to see if I was, you know, the kind of rabbi they wanted. It's like a town hall. Right, exactly. And this is they did with the other candidates, too. And I remember um, one woman got up, like she was like the spokesman for a whole group of people. Mm-hmm. And uh, she got up, and what was the most important first question? Would I sing Hatikva? Okay. That was like the most important thing they could think about. So I don't remember. I think I said, hum a few bars and I'll see if I can do it or whatever. I, I'd spoken to a gifter about you this. Said, I knew, you said Kenner Lowe, one of them. Right, right. 
And that woman, uh, in the end, is a was, is a relative of ours. Her <laughs> granddaughter married one of my one of my grandsons. Really, I hope you one think of my sons. <laughs> I hope you said. thanked her for putting you on the hot seat like that. <laughs> I, so um, it was a very interesting thing. But I told them, I said, look, I grew up in this community. I feel a responsibility to it. Most of you know me. I said, if I do come here to be the rabbi, I will work for you 24-7, but on one condition. I said that I'm the boss of this shul. There's no board of directors, no president. I mean, there is. But when it comes to deciding what goes on in this shul, right, is my decision, as long as it's a halachic thing. But I'll decide what's halachic and not. And if I think painting the shul pink is a halachic issue, then that's what's going to be. If you think that I'm that stupid, that I'll make everything into a halachic issue, then don't hire me. Right? I understand there are things that have nothing to do that the rabbi, it's not the rabbi's decision, it's the kahikila. I definitely will let that go through a democratic process. But I'll be the decider, right? If you accept that, if that's the kind of rabbi you want, then I'm for the job. If not, then there's other people there. There are fine people. I figured after I said that, no one will ever vote for you. <laughs> Either and, they'll love you so much <laughs> that you're there forever, or they'll right. just not touch you. And I figured that's it, okay. And I had they, I knew some of the other candidates. I really said <laughs> that they're really good people. You know, I think those are the people you should you should. Uh... In the end, the summer comes, and after they had all the probes, and I get a call from the president of the shul, um, you won. I said, won what? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was uh, we went. We went with like a year trial. Um, the shiva hired my good friend, uh, thinking that if I come back, so I still have my job in the in the shiva, the dorm counselor. And um, we were there for nine years. We uh, we built an eruv in the community and a mikveh and uh, really built up a fine community. Uh, people who said, but I know him when he's eight years old. How can I come to him, you know, as a rabbi? These people came to me with their most intimate shilas and problems by the end. Mm. And um, I really had no reason to leave except for what happened, how I got to Eretz Yisrael. Well, let's hear about that. The, the, um, I was there for about seven years, six, six or seven years, um, I pretty much had almost a life contract there. And um, uh, one Shabbos Beratius, we find 11 people. There were about 100, 150 families uh, from the whole spectrum of Yiddishkeit because it was the only from shul in the neighborhood at the time, in North Miami Beach, Young Israel, Greater Miami. And uh, we were all different kinds of yarmulkes, uh, from from black black to knitted to uh, Flat, to um, puffy. everything and Baruch Hashem people got along together because they had no choice. Um, as the kihila grew, so uh, one Shabbos Bereshis, we found eleven families had left the shul and started another shul in somebody's house, a breakaway shul, and um, it became a very political and very difficult uh, year. At the end of that year, um, my balabatim, a group of them, got together and said, um, you've had a difficult year. One of the complaints that these 11 people had was that Yeshua was too far to the right and uh, not Zionistic enough. The rabbi didn't speak about Israel at the time and wasn't Zionistic. So they said, we decided we're going to send you for a three-week vacation in Israel. We'll, what's it called, take care of it. We'll take care of your children. We had eight children at the time. We'll farm them out. And you go take a good rest for three weeks. And since you never, either you, you or your wife were ever in Eretz Israel, maybe you'll come back more Zionistic. Right, I was huh. trying to think, do they want you to rest or, be, or do they want you to like... Uh... Right, they, they, that was just like a, a side <laughs> thing. They, they didn't really care the people. Who, who needs to leave Miami to rest somewhere else? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, change uh, of place. A change of scenery. Yeah. So um, we went, we traded our house with somebody who wanted to be in Miami at the time who lived overlooking the coastal. Oh, wow. So that's where we stayed. You got the, the better end of the day. Right, yeah. right. 
and um, we 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 toured the country for three weeks our, on our own. And um, I remember that uh, uh, we had been up north, came back on a Friday, and um, we found out that the electricity had been turned off in the apartment because they didn't pay the electric bill or somehow when it was in the Arab electric company. I had to go and pay the bill. And uh, somehow I got lost. I almost got up on Harabais. Wow. Well, except a little Arab boy told me, that you're not allowed to be here. So he just saved me from wow. going up to Harabais. And um, I met the previous rabbi of the young Israel who had moved to Israel, the Rabbi Porish, on a bus. And um, he asked me, what's it called? How are things going, you know, in your vacation here? I said, well, I'll tell you the truth. I came back to a freezing apartment. They turned off the electricity. I just now almost ended up on Harabai. He said, that's great. I said, why? He said, because the people who come here and are just tourists and will never settle here have an easy time. Hmm. But somebody who eventually is going to end up here Right, Eretz Yisrael is nitna be Yisurim. If you have Yisurim, it means that someday you're going to be here. I said okay. At, at that point, it didn't mean too much to me. You just wanted your electricity back, right? right. <laughs> and we went back to Miami when we landed in JFK um, on the first leg of the trip back. We looked at each other and we said, "What are we doing here?" And we decided that's it. We're going. We're moving to Eretz Yisrael. Really? <laughs> and, what what uh, part of Eretz Yisrael did you fall? In? I mean, obviously. Uh, so I, I I thought I would bring the whole Kehila with me to Eretz Yisrael. How how old were you at this time? I was. Yeah, I'm about thirty five. Young. I was like, yeah, really I was young. a. Ra- I started the Rabbonus at twenty six, twenty five. Yeah. So you thought you're going to bring everyone? Right. We're going to, and and not only that, there was a uh, shliach of Bnei Akiva in the shul. And um, he helped me to that the Israeli government were willing to give us a place in Beit Shemesh, which was just beginning to be developed, to bring over the Kehila. That lasted about two weeks, mm-hmm. since I realized... Let's see how Zionistic they right, really are. <laughs> right, how in the world am I going to find jobs for everybody and bring everybody over? Right. It's an impossibility. So I basically forgot about it. And um, two years later... Next two years, we built up the Kehila, um, the breakaway built up, uh, but Baruch Hashem it became less of a political problem, and uh, the shul grew, and we built a new shul, a new building, and I basically had a life contract there, and I, this idea of going to Eretz Israel was put on a back burner. Someday I'll probably retire there. Two years later, on a Friday. My wife gets a call from one of my Balabatim. She, her parents live in Eretz Israel, and they were looking to move. And uh, she wanted to find an American community to, uh, to resettle in. And she heard about Moshe Matityo, which was just starting at the time. And they were having a convention to get um, people interested in moving there in uh, Staten Island, Simcha by the Sea, a Shabbaton. So uh, this woman called up the people representing the Moshav and asked them a lot of questions about it, you know. And one of the questions was, who's the rabbi there? They said, well, we don't have a rabbi right now. We had a rabbi, he left, and we're looking for somebody. So she called my wife and said, I just found out about this American community in Eretz Israel. They're looking for a rabbi. Let's move few families together, your husband will be the rabbi there, and we'll all move together and build up this moshav in Eretz Yisrael, which had 11 families in it at the time. So uh, my wife tells me, here's a chance. We can now go to Eretz Yisrael. It can be the Rav or whatever there. So I was not really interested in leaving Miami. We just had about 300 families and a new building, and I had a life contract to go to somewhere in the middle of nowhere with 11 families. But um, I said, okay, look, I'll look into it at least. So I called the Israeli shliach who was representing the Moshav, and I told him, I just heard about your community, this community you represent, and I heard you're looking for a rabbi. He said, listen, why don't you come 
to the convention, to the Shabbaton, right? She says, I, I can't promise you'll be the rabbi, but you could always work with the chickens or whatever. Oh, I said to my wife, this is ridiculous. This is, uh, forget about it. But um, we met with two other families, and they were also interested. So I said, okay, you know what? I'll at least call Rabbi Gifter, who sent me to Miami. I figured he'd tell me for sure, stay where you are, and that's it. So I called Rabbi Gifter, and I painted what I had in Miami as colorful as I could. <laughs> and he, he knew it. He, was, he had visited us many times in Miami. And, and in fact, uh, they came and raised money in the community every year for tells. So they had a good vested interest <laughs> in that community. And then I painted what I heard about Moshe Matit Yahu as black as possible. <laughs> I figured they'll tell me, stay where you are. Gifter tells me, um, go there and check it out with two eyes open. If you can make a Parnassa there, then pack your bags, take your family, and run. I said, where am I running to? He said, to Eretz Israel. He said, that's the future. He said, I said, but what about Miami? He said, don't worry. There'll be plenty of people who want your job in Miami. I said, that was not exactly what I'm concerned about. <laughs> the, uh, in any case, okay, I said, after that, I told my wife, Rav Gifter really doesn't know what's in Matit Yo. So I got to call the Boston Rebbe because he spent his winters in Miami, in North Miami Beach, in fact, and I got to know him, and he knew me. But he also knew what was in Matityo because he had a family that was close with him that lived there, that was going to live there. So I called him, figuring he'll tell me for sure, stay where you are. And he said, I'll tell you a secret. We're moving Boston to Eretz Israel at least half of the year. That's before they started in Harnov. He said, I can't think of any reason to tell anyone who has an opportunity to build a Torah in Eretz Israel not to go. That was my last chance. I said, i got to speak to Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky. <laughs> <laughs> and Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky told me, look, if you can see to it that another yeshiva rabbi will take over your position in the young Israel, then I think it's a good thing to go. If not, you have responsibility to your community, not to, not to be mafkarit. And that was it. So we said, okay, we're going to go and check it out. So we, um, I went to New York and met with the representative of the families of Matit Yahu and this Israeli shliach, and I was very impressed, very impressed. And they're idealistic, and they're building a new community, American style. And I invited them to come back to meet with me to Miami, and um, we made up that I would go there in January and um, for 10 days and check it out be able to see if this is really something that I could. So we went, um, the husbands of two families, this, this family that had called my wife and another family, and my wife and myself went. My shul thought I was going to speak for Or Sameach. They had no idea of any of these things that was going on. And uh, we went there for 10 days. I mean, our first experience was really hard. They picked me up from the airport in a pickup truck and uh, let Baruch Hashem let me sit in the cab. Hmm. But in any case, we went farther and farther into no man's land. It dark, nothing. Uh, in those days, there was nothing there, no rose, no nothing. Um, in Moshe there was one phone in the office. Nobody else, nobody had phones. Um, there was uh, generators for electric power. It was, it was in the middle of nowhere. It was freezing cold. They put me in a house. And there was, I didn't think there was any heat. There was a radio on the table, but it wasn't a radio. It was one of these little heaters. <laughs> in any case, I told my wife, you got us into this. There's no way we are staying here. What's it called? Tomorrow we're getting out of here as fast as possible. And the next day we overslept and the sun came out and we began to meet the families there. And I went around and met Rabbonim of similar Yishuvim under Paul Agudas Israel who I would be connected with. And by the time we left there, 10 days later, we were clear that we're going to try it out, that we're, we're moving. I went back to my kehila. I called the meeting of the whole kehila. I said, um, two years ago, you sent me to Eretz Israel to see if I'd be more Zionistic. 
So I've decided to move to a West Bank settlement. <laughs> What's it called? To be the Rav. So they told draft. me. They said, "What does that do with Zionism? What's it called? Stay here and send money. You don't have to go there." <laughs> <laughs> so um, they thought that it was, you know, Mishigas that they uh, get, back, out, yeah. get out of my system. I said, "Go there. You know, you'll be back in six months. We're not going to hire another rabbi. We'll just get some retiree to take over. When you tell us you want to come back, let let us know." They were very supportive, though. But they were sure that I would be back in six months. And we were there. We've been there for, uh, what, 38 years. So we wow. didn't go back. Wow. <laughs> but, uh, I, I don't think they're still waiting, are they? <laughs> I don't think so, no. They, who, who ended up taking Rabbi, you over? Then, then the ended up was Rabbi David Lairfield, Zechot Sarek Levrochi, was just nifter. He was a rabbi in South Beach of a shul that was basically dying. He had only elderly people. He, he told me he has two functions. One is to just to tell them which doctors to go to <laughs> and then to bury them. <laughs> he said that was the, the shul. So this was an opportunity for him. Right. And um, he was he was well known to people, most a lot of people in the Kahila, and he was there since I left. So wow. he was there 38 years. Did you go back to visit? Yeah, Adel? many times. And I went back to visit. I even spoke in the breakaway shul and... Uh, <laughs> I, I actually went with Biyama Swerdlik to, I don't know, it was around 10 years ago, I was telling you a little before, I went to Moshev Matsuyot to, to you for Shabbos and had a great time, and, and it looked a lot more developed and thriving oh, yes, than yeah, yeah. when you first got there. Yes, for they sure. don't have any radio heaters anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so so what, what happened to the community there? The community there grew very, it started out to be a Moshev Shitufi, which means uh, basically socialism. Everybody worked somewhere on the Moshav. They had uh, agriculture. They had a, a, what's it called, a kerem, a vineyard uh, off the Moshav. They had two chicken businesses that were run from the Moshav, uh, one for eggs and one for uh, meat. And everybody got involved. Uh, you know, uh, when it came time for shivuk to get the chickens to market, uh, everybody, men, women, children, would come down and help put them in cages or whatever. And, um, but that was not for Americans, to right. the socialism. It lasted a few years, and then um, we decided that we're going to turn it into a regular Moshav, not a, not a Moshav Shitufi. We gave up pretty much all of the agriculture things. We rented it out to others, and people found jobs, and um, eventually everybody got uh, their houses for free. Um, beautiful, that's the houses that are worth millions of shekel now. And um, and it attracted more people. Eventually, there were 30 houses there to begin with, but only 11 families. So a lot of things were used for the office, the shul, the, the garden, and so on. They were giving them for free to, to entice people to move there? Um, no, the people who were there, because we turned over into a regular Moshav, instead of a Moshav Shitufi, everybody then had the right to have private ownership. And okay. we worked out that you could, people could own their houses. Right. And we attracted more people there then, but the education didn't exist that much. Our kids traveled 40, 45 minutes by bus to um, an, another from Moshav, Yisodot, to education eventually. They built a Chinuch Asmoy school in the nearby Hashmonoim neighborhood. Um, and eventually, Kiryat Sefer um, built near us big uh, thousands of families eventually. Um, in any case, the, uh, so the, the area grew tremendously. Um, but the, uh, the option for an American-style from education didn't exist at the time there. It was more uh, Israeli style, uh, real B'nai Bra kind of, and that that wasn't good for a lot of people. So uh, many people moved to um, not from the Moshab, but moved once if they came Olim, they went to Ramat Beit Shemesh or whatever, where they had more similar education. So uh, eventually, we started to accept Israelis too, but Israelis who wanted to live in a kehila, that doesn't exist too much in Eretz Israel. Right, a kehila. People live and everybody for themselves. But to have a cohesive kehila with a rav or whatever doesn't exist. And there were a lot of Israelis that wanted that who also knew English. Um, 
And uh, so we began accepting that, and then the Moshav really started to grow. Now we have about 150 families, 150 families. Um, it's still majority of English speaking, but there's a lot of Israelis also. Um, eventually, um, another shul was built, not with another rav, it's all under me, but the, the Israelis wanted more of an Israeli Thai shul. Yeah. And uh, we have another minion of people, more yeshivisha people that wanted uh, something more like that, and uh, not a regular minion. And there's also is, Rabbi Fisher's there, yeshiva? Rabbi Fisher's yeshiva. We, we had our own yeshiva uh, that we started uh, many years ago. Uh, Yeshiva Gedola Matis Yahu for American Bachrim that basically wouldn't fit into the other Israeli um, yeshivas that were for Americans. They weren't for Mir or Brisk or whatever. But they're boys who were serious, wanted to learn, but maybe their background wasn't as strong or whatever. And the Baruch Hashem, we, we had that yeshiva for maybe 15 years, something like that. And we uh, had a lot of alumni and a lot of... Uh, a lot of people that we really made a, an impression on. Um, eventually, uh, we closed down the yeshiva uh, because the enrollment wasn't, uh, didn't warrant to keep it up. And for two years, there was no yeshiva on Matityahu. We had a kolo that basically was an English-speaking kolo that was from people on the Moshav and some people from Kiryat Sefer, English-speaking. And then Rabbi Fisher moved to Moshe Matit Yahu. Um, he was a Rebbe at Or Yerushalayim, OJ, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, he moved to Moshe Matit Yahu. He was supposed to um, help his father-in-law, Rabbi Brazil, to uh, move his yeshiva to Givat Ze'ev, and eventually, but he fell in love with Matit Yahu. Hmm. And uh, he decided that maybe he can start a yeshiva if we would give him permission to open up a yeshiva in Matit Yahu. And um, I told him, fine, right? And he left Or Yerushalayim. He had a lot of following here because he was a Rebbe in, in, um, in what's it called, Shah Yosher. Right, right. I, I was there, actually, at the time yeah, when he was there. And he, yeah, he had a lot of very fine following. So he started the, uh, the yeshiva at Matit Yahu. We helped him tremendously. And he's built it up. He has like 200-something Bachrim. Wow. And not only there's a lot of Bachrim, but he's a very, very successful. Guys come there that you wouldn't know they're Jewish when they come, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, within a year, they look more like a yeshiva Bachar. Within two years, they couldn't ever tell that he is very, very, uh, very successful. Wow. I feel like I just heard your life story in 40 minutes. Yeah. Like, that, that's incredible. <laughs> there's, there's so much more. But we're going to try to film, film the blinks right now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, so so we just talked about, like, you know, where you were and how you got to Moshe Matisio. But now we want to get into meat and potatoes about you. And, and uh, again, Nafi, don't worry, you'll get to your question. <laughs> uh, but um, so you speak around the world. Obviously, it's slowed down with COVID. But you've spoken in so many places. Uh, what's, your, what's your favorite topic to talk about to people? Um, my favorite topic, I think, is uh, the idea that uh, Yiddishkeit is not just keeping a bunch of rules, but it's creating a, uh, a, a, an environment of what Torah is and a Torah personality. And I think that's missing a lot. And uh, people have to understand that the mitzvahs were given to create a... Um, uh, again, a Torah personality, a Torah environment. Um, Yaakov Avinu tells Esav, in love and Garti, this week, Sedra, Vitarig Mitzvah Shamarti, Vilodamadati Mi Maisavaroyim. I lived with Lovan, I kept all Tarig Mitzvahs, and I didn't learn from Lovan's evil deeds. It seems from there that you can keep all Tarig Mitzvahs and still have to say, I didn't learn from Lovan's evil deeds. That means that you can keep the letters of the law, but somehow your whole personality and your whole environment is not really what Torah wants. And to get that message across, that's how you build a kahila, and that's how you make people understand that there's more to Judaism than just keeping a bunch of, of rules. And I think that's my favorite topic. Mm -hmm. so, what advice would you give people... It seems like you've made some pretty big decisions in your life in terms of transitions from 
going back to going from Cleveland to Florida and Florida to Israel. And those are really pivotal moments of your life. What, what advice would you give to really everybody who needs to make big decisions in their life, whether they're moving somewhere or they're dating or whatever it may be, how can they make that decision with more clarity? When you were eight, you knew exactly what you wanted to be. I'm 29. <laughs> I still don't know what I want to be, you know? The, um, I, I think, first of all, you have to have someone that you knows you that can give you objective advice. That's the purpose for advice. Advice is not that you don't know the information. Advice is that you know all the information, but you're very biased. Mm -hmm. And deep yeah. down, you want one way, but you want to fool yourself into thinking that you made an intelligent, objective decision. So what really happens is that when you have a, you're faced with that kind of thing, you have deep down what you really want, so you look at that option in the most positive way and see all the positives, very little negative. The, one, the other option that you don't want, you see all the negatives and very little positive. And then you say, well, this has so many positives, this has so many negatives, I'm making an objective decision. But what's really going on is you're doing what you want to do right. and not what really. So you need somebody who knows you, who knows your situation, who can put himself in your shoes without your bias and subjectivity. And at least he, doesn't, he can't make the decision for you, but he can give you enough objectivity to see what the real options are. Then you can make the decision. You're making a real, intelligent, objective decision, not just following your heart. So I think you need somebody like that. It, it could be a rabbi. It doesn't have to be. Be somebody that knows you, that can put himself in your shoes and, and, and not make the decision for you, but help you work it out and see what the, what the options are. And Rabbi That's, Kifter was Yeah, was I, had my, I had my rebellion. And I, uh, I, I, when the, my, my first years in Rabbonis, I was constantly on the phone with them to ask them, I, I'm, I'm, I'm inexperienced. How do I relax to this situation, that situation? And Baruch Hashem, I, uh, I got a lot of, a lot of uh, hadracha right, and guidance. And eventually you pick it up and you get to know how to do it on your own. But uh, it's important to have somebody like that. That's really beautiful. So there is... Obviously, you knew we we're going to ask this at some point, but there is a, a video image going around about you, um, of you game. in, Glas in Glasgow. Um, could you just tell oh, us? Oh, it was in Glasgow? In Glasgow. Scotland? Glasgow, yeah. Scotland. Oh, wow. So, for those who don't know, you were by a soccer game and you were learning. Right. You're learning from a safer, and I think you were caught on camera on TV in the airport. Yeah, I, t I tell you the whole story. I've, I've only said it about 10,000 <laughs> times. <laughs> I never heard it, so, and I'm sure a few people okay, listening but also. What happened was the following My son in law and daughter um, were the chaplain in uh, all the universities of, um, of what's it called, of Scotland, from the British uh, rabbinate. Okay, that was his job. He, you know, so he had gone. He was a student of mine in my yeshiva, and um, he married my daughter, and eventually he went to uh, Orlegola, which is trains people in Kiruv and Chinuch or whatever, and then you commit yourself to two years in Chutzlaretz to work somewhere in Kiruv. So he got this job in Scotland to be the, the chaplain for all the universities, very good at it. And they went, they, they lived in Scotland, and uh, in Glasgow, in uh, Gifnak, which uh, there was one shul there, uh, close to the Rav, and, uh, and uh, they had, um, what's it called, at the time, three children, four children, four children. And um, we went to visit them. And um, during that time, the night we were, the next day we were leaving from our visit there. Um, that night, the night before, there was a soccer match between Israel and Scotland. And it was a big deal. Like Israel's coming for the, the whole shul was going to go. They rented buses. Mm -hmm. And my son in law, who had all these Jewish students that he, what's it called, was responsible for, um, 
it was, you know, Israeli pride or whatever, it was a good idea to get them to go to the soccer game too. So they had tickets for this soccer game and the whole shul was going and my grandchildren wanted very much to go but they felt bad because it was our last night there and they'd have to leave Bobby and Zadie to go to the soccer right. game. So I said, look, I'll make it easy for you. We'll go along. <laughs> so You, don't have you to really leave. want to become you more Zionistic, I guess. Right. This is a- <laughs> they don't want to leave, want to leave us. I, I'll learn at home. I can learn there too. What's it called? What's the difference? And this way, you, we'll be with you. So that's what happened. We went to, to the soccer game. I was not really interested. I don't even know what soccer is. If it was a baseball game, maybe I would have been yeah. more interested. The yeah. Soccer Yankees, game. Yankees. You grew up in the you grew up in the Bronx. The Yankees, right? Right. right exactly. <laughs> so uh, soccer did not interest me at all. So I took my. Uh, I was learning uh, Yerushalmi, uh, Dafyomi, Yerushalmi at the time, and uh, I took my safer, and I was learning. Uh, what's it called? Uh, and uh, then I heard like you know cheers. I looked up from the safer for a second. Uh, what happened was I think Israel made its first goal or something. At that moment, um, my wife tells me she sees this gigantic camera focus on us. <laughs> and she, she tells me, I think they, what's it called? And then I've seen it, you know, the, yeah. what, what it was. At the time, the guy says, uh, well, here's somebody. Uh, I think that's probably a good read because he's not interested in the cloud and that's going <laughs> on over here. And... Um, and immediately, my son-in-law told my wife, uh, you were just on world TV, what's uh-huh. it called? And the Israelis in the most I was doing a soccer game. And the, the other people who started, which went, it went viral <laughs> over the whole world. Then I got started getting calls from TV stations in Chutz Laaretz and in Israel. Right? They want me to come on the program. I said, look. You know, this is enough for me. <laughs> I said, if you want to interview my children, because hate, right? But not me. I'm not. I'm not. This is not for me. And that that was it. Was just a very interesting thing. What did you think? What do you think they wanted to talk to you about? No, they want to talk about you know what's it called uh, this learning and is it more important than a soccer? They couldn't believe there's anything more important than right. a soccer game, right? Why would I want to be learning at a soccer <laughs> game? And. Um, so they did interview my children for Israeli television or whatever, and um, that was basically what they said. They said, well, if he was learning, how come they lost? Uh-huh. So, the, so the, the woman who was there said, if he hadn't been learning, they would have lost by more. <laughs> <laughs> and Baruch Hashem, they lost. I was afraid they would make me the mascot, you know, oh, wow. invite me to come you and get learn season, by You that. get season tickets. <laughs> I don't think he wants that. It's funny because so many, unfortunately, some people, when they're learning, they're daydreaming about sports. You're actually by a sporting event and you're, you're learning. Um, okay, a lot of Svarim that I've opened, I want to say most, but a lot of them that I've opened, I see that you have a scum up before. Is there a reason that you're the go-to person for us, scholars? I've asked the same question. I don't know why. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth. I mean, the more I, the, it's a chesed. If, if it helps somebody, right? So how can I say no to them if they're? Right? There's some books that I have rejected. I, I I just can't be involved in. But most of them are very nice, and if having my name in it, right, helps a person get it published or whatever, or sold, which I can't imagine, because like you said, there's so many, so why do people take anything serious? And I do read, I don't read the whole book, but I read parts of it, and I get to know who the person is. And if I feel that, you know, it's a, it's a good book, or whatever, and I can do the chesed to the person, so why shouldn't I do it? But uh, yeah, I, don't, I have no answer to that. I don't know why. Right? I guess maybe, look, it, people know me because I speak all over, and uh, so they know the name. Um, Moshab Matityahu is a little place in the middle of nowhere, and people all over the world know the place. So uh, Baruch Hashem, it's, uh, if that helps people, then fine. I don't know much about the, what I'm about to ask, but I know it's a thing, and I guess maybe you could tell us more about it. Internet Ask the Rabbi. I was asked to ask you about it. And the question is, were you the original Internet Ask the Rabbi? Original? I don't know. I had, I had a website that somebody on our Moshav um, developed. His name was Rafi Shachar. And he was a, a tech 
um, what's it called? Uh, and he asked me to make a website, and this way we can um, get the Torah that's basically said in Matityo or in other places uh, world over. What year is this around? Well, this was in probably in the 1990s. Wow. Really it's early. Really ahead of the times. And um, I thought it was an interesting idea. He, would, he did all the work or whatever. I just provided him with, um, with shiurim. He put them up, and then he said, he thinks it would be a good idea if we opened up to questions. People would send in questions. It wasn't live. And I would, what's it called, um, I would answer these questions. There are thousands of things that over the years accumulate over there. The website basically hasn't developed for years. For it's, it's been dormant, but it's still there with all these questions. What's the name of the website? The website is rabbileft.net. Nice. Dot .net. .net. That's old school. <laughs> and, and yeah, what type of questions were these? Uh, everything. Yeah, anything questions. you could imagine. Really? Could, yeah. could you give us some samples of well, how... People asked about... Um, uh, how how they should deal with Lubavitch when it was you know uh, very messianic. Um, people asked about um, uh, what I think about uh, secular music and uh, and then the regular shilas of you know regular halachic kind of of shilas. Um, uh, again, there's almost about two thousand, at least more than that uh, questions, wow. and some people have. Um, asked for permission to um, record them or put them on discs, right? That's when there still were, you know, <laughs> CDs, big, yeah. big discs, oh, and they and they were selling the those, uh, selling them, I guess, uh, whatever. I know I, I didn't have any mm. financial thing from this. I told them anything that you can, you know, make some kind of money on to make up. You know, you spend your time and you put money into this also, so. You keep it and uh, right. and use it to 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 promote the the website. How many Sfarim do you own? Um, do you know that? Do you know the answer to that? About thirty thousand, maybe a little wow. bit. Wow! Really? Yeah, we have a. When I went to the Matityahu, I was from the time I was in day school, I started buying Sfarim, <laughs> and uh, when I finally went to Tells, I had quite a few Sfarim. And um, because of that, I got a room instead of with three roommates. I got a room with two <laughs> roommates and a bookcase wow. in between the two beds. My roommate was Rabbi Foyer, Rabbi Chaim Foyer, so Rabbi Gifter's son-in-law right. now. But uh, at the time, he wasn't. And we we had uh, two roommates and a bookcase. And um, then when I got married, I bought more and more svarim. And when I went to Miami, even more, we had in Miami, I had a whole room just of Svarim. Um, and then in Eretz Yisrael, since I already had thousands of Svarim, I made them a condition that I would come, but I had to have a place for my Svarim. So they gave you their so own again, house? They gave me two houses. Two. Oh, my gosh. One house to live in and one house for my Svarim. So thirty thousand, over 30,000 Svarim. Yeah, yeah. And then since then, I forget a lot more, and they... Eventually took that house away because they wanted to sell it to right. a person who was our neighbor, and they built me a second story to my house, which is mostly my library and my study, but we added two, three, uh, two bedrooms and a sukkah room with a movable roof, um, so we had three bedrooms up there. And that's, what, what type of farm is it? like? Uh, everything you can imagine. Really? Do you think there's English, anybody in the Hebrew. world who has more than you? I'm sure that people have more. What really? is? Do you, I don't know. I have no clue. Well, I, first of all, I know Rabbi Feiner is obsessed with Sfarim, so <clears throat> I, I feel like I want to get him there if he hasn't been there yet. It, it, do you have a favorite safer from those 30,000? Favorite safer. I, I, the truth is, yeah, but maybe my, what's it called? Uh, because I'm a Telzer. Uh, the Shure Das is the Tells uh, Musser Hashkofa Sefer. I would imagine I could say that. I I put out some Svarim myself right. in English. And the first one I put out was from Art Scroll on the Parshas. And I called it Shure Bina because 
when you have Das, you build on that with Venus. I figured that's a good yeah. good title. It's called Outlaws and Insights in English, but that was, I guess, I guess you could say that uh, the Shuri Das was my how, how much do you think a collection of over 30,000 Swarm is worth? I don't know. My children are concerned about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's awesome. I, I could probably ask a million questions about the Svarum collection. But I ask you one or two more questions before we get to our like classic questions to ask at the end. Uh, the first question is: What do you think about like uh, learning work life balance? Okay, that that's also a pet uh, discussion. Um, Claudia Israel, um, from its very inception, had. A shevet two shvatim that were devoted to learning full time. Yisachar and Levi, and then there were ten other shvatim, and they were people who worked, right? And that's Klal Yisrael. The Briskarov even says the majority of Klal Yisrael are people who follow the shita of Rabbi Shmuel, that a person should combine learning Torah with earning a living, and the major- minority of Klal Yisrael have to follow the the um, shita of Reb Shimon Bar Yochai that a person should exclusively learn Torah. And those are the people who are Shevet Levi, right, as the Rambam describes. People who are dedicated totally to Torah, they're learning, they're teaching, and so on. And even within that, there's there's differences. People who are Abonim and people in Kiruv and uh, people who are administrators and or whatever, they're in the Torah Torah-only community, and then there's the people who combine Torah with a, and both of them are valid, and there and there is uh, um, guidelines for people who are learning Torah all the time, what their guidelines are, and people who are combining Torah with a with a worldly occupation, the guidelines for them, and they're both valid uh, members of Klal Yisrael, and Klal Yisrael needs both of them, so. Uh, and I have uh, a, a series of shurim that I give in the seminaries and to what's it called, to um, uh, Bochrim um, and to the people that I teach to be Rabbonim or whatever, that they should understand that. Because it's, it's very much misunderstood and abused, either that... It's only the people who are learning full time are really doing what's right, and everybody else is second class citizens. That I find in Eretz Israel a lot. Or the opposite: there's communities where, if you're sitting and learning Torah full time in a kollel, you're a batlan and whatever, and a parasite. And it's so people who are working or whatever and uh, paying their way. They're the ones who are the are doing what's proper. Neither is right. There's a need for both of them, and they have to work together. Then the Sverno says that the menorah represented this. There were three branches to the right. They represented the people learning Torah full time. There were three branches to the left. They represent the people who were combining Torah with a worldly occupation. And he says when they all face the middle, which is the light of Hashem, then that light spreads to Cloud Yisrael from both sides. And I like to add to that when they face the middle, they face each other. Mm-hmm. When each one can respect the other side, then the light of Torah goes to the whole cloud Israel. That's really beautiful. If you can sit down with anybody from history who's no longer alive and spend an hour with them, who would it be? Oh, wow. Well. I mean, I'll go for, for broke because <laughs> to think of a million things. I'd like to sit down with Moshe Rabbeinu and... Uh, but, what, would he, uh, what would he discuss with Rosh Rabbeinu? What would I discuss with him? I, I don't know. Whatever he decided he wanted to discuss with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Um, what's the worst advice you've ever received? The worst advice I ever received. I don't know. I, we, we have to apologize. We typically give people this question before. <laughs> we didn't get a chance to give it to you. I hear. What, what's, the, what's the best advice you've ever received? Best advice was uh, from the person who introduced me to my wife. Oh. That was good advice. Nice. I like and, that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then the advice I got from Rob Gifter, 
that sent me to Miami and then sent me to Eretz Yisrael. Um, looking back, right, if either of those decisions had been different, uh, I think my life would have been very, very different. Right. Right? When I when I went to Eretz Yisrael from Miami, right, I was looking forward in Miami to be the president of the Orthodox Rabbinical Council of Miami, and I figured that was like in a pinnacle of yeah. who knows what. And I when I decided to go to Eretz Yisrael to a place of eleven families, I said, okay, look, it'll probably be better for my children there, and um, and probably. What's it called? I'll be able to learn a lot more, or whatever. And uh, but I'm going now into uh, you know um, disappearing from the face of the earth. <laughs> and uh, Baruch Hashem, after being in Eretz Israel, I've seen more of the world than I ever saw when I was in America. I've been, and uh, Baruch Hashem, I have a uh, an opportunity to have a influence over a lot of people. So uh, looking back. Uh, uh, both of those advices, uh, uh, sending me to Miami, which was a preparation for being able then to end up in Eretz Israel uh, and building a community there um, and having the opportunity of of having some kind of connection world over, um, I guess that was the best advice I ever got. If, if you have lifetime contracts, I, I think that means that you probably don't have... Like, if you have a lifetime contract in, in Moshe Matasio, I don't know if this is the last place you're going to be. Like, <laughs> it could be somewhere else. Um, so, yeah, I have two more questions I want to ask. Uh, one is... This is a little interesting, and I, I got this intel from people who know you well, and I think it could be interesting. We could cut it out if it's just <laughs> too weird. But Nachi has no clue what to ask. So it's, just, it's a good way to get someone From what nervous. I understand... Okay, so you, you speak into... And we didn't even get so into... You speak into... How many countries have you spoken in? How many what? Countries have you spoken in? Oh, wow. Uh, South Africa and England and Scotland. And, a lot, uh, a lot. You, a you've lot, spoken yeah. all around the world. Yeah. And uh, there was a point in your life where maybe it was a few months, you lost your voice? Yes, or- I didn't lose it. It um, I had a, a um, paralyzed vocal cord, and I sounded like Mickey Mouse. Like, okay. Like really like Mickey Mouse? Re- really like Mickey Mouse. For how long My was children it? thought that I was really, <laughs> my, well, I sounded like Minnie Mouse. Oh. <laughs> and to tell you what's it called, the way I sounded, I, what's it called, answered the phone at home, and... People would say, um, is a Rav there? <laughs> right, it's a call. They thought they were talking to my wife. Oh, my gosh. And um, so I, after a while, I said, um, I'll give them the message or whatever. <laughs> but uh, th- I sounded mamish. I, it was a Shiloh whether I could dive him for the omelet. It was called Isha. Uh, really? <laughs> well, I, it wasn't really a Shiloh. Okay. <laughs> but it, no, no, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's the, the a speaker's like worst. I didn't even know this is a concept. I, I, um, it, it lasted for about eight, nine months. Wow. What happened was I was driving to school to teach in a seminary, and um, all of a sudden my voice changed. Like, and I thought I had, was, it was sore, I was hoarse. I was, I was getting a cold or something. And um, this went on for two, three days, and um, I went to see a doctor, and um, he said, um, you're not hoarse, because I wouldn't go away. I drank soup, I drank tea, and uh, nothing was going. He said, I think you have a paralyzed vocal cord. And he sent me to a specialist, and they took a scope down my, and he said, yeah, you have a paralyzed vocal cord, but it didn't take away your voice completely, but the vocal cords now are not close enough, so that's what comes out. Changes the pitch. Right. He said, we could operate, we could, there's things to do. He said, but I think just leave it right now. And um, it usually goes away in seven, eight months. This is a specialist. You're like, oh boy. Right. (laughs) Exactly how I sound. Oh gosh. um, But I didn't let it stop me. Really? I I, I said, um, I said, look, I'm going to start, right? my, My grandchildren think that I'm Minnie Mouse. Right? I've convinced them, and they're very proud of me. Mm. I said, you get it out of your system, and then we'll continue with the shear. And that's what I did. I spoke here uh, Hanukkah time. We got stuck in New York. We had come here for I don't know for what, and then El Al started dry, uh, flying on Shabbos, and Revelyoshev told me not to go back on El Al. 
And um, so we were stuck here until I could get other reservations. And they asked me to speak in Shar Yoshev, Shabbos Hanukkah. I got up and I spoke exactly like that. Uh, what's it called? I, one, one thing I had, I, um, I had said something um, in, in uh, criticism of someone on this website. And um, the, the person who I criticized contacted me and said I had wrong information. And what I criticized was based on wrong information, and he proved to me that was the case. So this had happened months before, the criticism. But now that I got the information that I was, I was basing it on something wrong, I had to apologize to him publicly. So on the same website... But now I spoke like any <laughs> mouse. Hmm. I said that I got information, and what I said negative about this person, criticism, I apologize, and it's not true. People who were against this person right, said that, wow, that was a cheap thing that he did to have somebody impersonate me. It doesn't even sound like me. No, <laughs> Imagine we did this interview, you sounded like that. That would be interesting. Huh? Right, yeah, it would be interesting. Well, I'm glad you got your voice back. Yeah. I want to end off with uh, a question, and I want you to give the details because I will reach out to them in particular um, and ask them. If, if they don't allow it, we just won't have this part. But the question is is from Binyamin Swerdlik, and he asked, have you ever converted anyone? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. His mother is a convert. That's why he asked you the question. Yeah, I figured. <laughs> and I, uh, yes, we converted her. But that is a really interesting story. Could you share the story? I'll, I'll obviously ask them for permission to share this. Yeah, they don't, they don't mind because it's in a book. Oh. And, they, and I asked them permission. Okay, there we to go. To put it in the book. Okay, then we could talk it's about in, it. In fact, it's in two books. And one, their names are mentioned. And they're, 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 there's nothing to be ashamed of. They're very proud of it. Um, the, uh, I'll tell you the story. I get a call um, one day in Miami. Um, uh, how, what's it called? I'm interested in uh, con- conversion. Um, I said, what religion are you? He said, I'm Jewish. So what do you want to convert then? He says, not for me, it's my girlfriend. I said, we don't convert for marriage. And how did you get my name anyway? He said, from the Yellow Pages. You know what that is? That's yeah, of course, okay. of course. We know. Oh, oh, ancient yeah. history. With the last door. That's ancient. Right. <laughs> so I, I said, well, I'm sorry, but you know, I really can't help you. And I was ready to hang up the phone. And the, and the split second, I said to myself, he's going to go to the next name in the yellow pages. He's going to find some conservative reform rabbi to convert. And that's it. Uh, I said, maybe I have a responsibility to see if I can stop this. So I first picked up the phone, and he didn't realize I was hanging up. I said, you know what, why don't you come in and we'll talk about it. So we made up a time, comes in, Benjamin Swerdlik's father, Dr. Richard Swerdlik, right? um, a, a, uh, what's it called, he's uh, um, uh, learning to be a doctor, and um, I see that he's really a fine person, and he's basically, his father was a, um, a chazan in a conservative temple, Right, and they're, they're traditional people, and I see that this guy, in in a minute, could become from, and so I said, you know what? Before I speak about converting your girlfriend, let's get to know you a little bit. So we invite him for Shabbos, and then another Shabbos, and within a month, he was coming to Shiurim. He already became Shomer Shabbos. Right, he was a, a really really fine guy. And um, after about a month of being involved with the Kahila and being by different people, he says, well, what about my girlfriend? I said, oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> the, um, I said, okay. I said, next thing. They, they, sh- this girl probably wants to marry a nice Jewish doctor. She probably has no interest in really being from. She's going to pull this guy down. He's already mamash a from guy. I, I got to convince her that she doesn't want to be Jewish. So I said, okay, let me meet your girlfriend. She comes in, and I, this is like, you know, Rusa Moavia. And she tells me she always wanted to be Jewish, not because of this Jewish doctor, but this just, you know, made it more intense. 
and she really wants to be, her mother even wanted to be Jewish or whatever, this is something that's, so I said, what do you know about Jew- Judaism? Well, you know, we eat bagels and lox, what, what exactly <laughs> do you know about Judaism that you so much want to be Jewish? I said, I'm gonna give you some books to read about what Judaism You're is. You're like 30,000 of them, yeah. <laughs> right, some Judaism is. And I figured, I gave her books that were, were uh, details about Shabbos and Taras and Mishpacha and um, some Hashkafa things from Victor Miller, very strong thing. I figured she'll look at these things, she'll send them back to me and say, uh, I'm not interested. <laughs> and that was it. And then I, we, we'd be able to work on this guy and she's out of the picture. Two weeks later, she calls me. It's exactly what I want. What's it called? And okay, so we started having her come for Shabbos to different families, so I could get an idea. They would see her, for, you know, close up. What kind of girl she is? And everybody said, "This is like Rusa Moavia. This, this girl's a tzaddikus." And um, I took her to meet all the rabbonim in Miami, and they all were very impressed with her. But I still, in the back of my mind, I said, she's a good actress, and she's doing this because she wants to marry this Jewish doctor, and after they're married, right, she's gonna drag him down. She doesn't really want this. She wants just to be able to marry a Jewish doctor, and she's putting on a good act. So I said, I gotta know. I can't, I'm gonna convert this girl, and I may be destroying this guy. So I called her in, and I said, look, the rabbis say that they're willing to convert you. But I want to tell you something that you may not know. Since you knew this guy before you converted, you're not allowed to marry him. I made up that halacha. <laughs> I do still want to convert. And she's silent for five minutes thinking. I said, you see, you were right. She doesn't want to convert. She just wants to marry this guy. She says to me, um, does that mean I can never get married? I said, no, no, no. We'll introduce you to somebody else, so just not him. You know, I wanted to tell her, we'll, we'll get you some Jewish garbage man or something, <laughs> you know, and, but not this doctor. She said, of course I want to become Jewish. I mean, I love him, but I want to become Jewish a lot more than that, right? So if it means it's between him and becoming Jewish, I want to become Jewish. Okay, said, we got both. <laughs> I, said, I said, no, I said, are you willing to tell him that? She said, yeah. I So she calls him, and I'm on the extension, and she's crying, and he, she says, the rabbi just gave me very, very good news and very bad news. He said that they're willing to convert me, but we can never get married. And he's crying on the other side. So I'm so happy for you, and you know I love you, but I want what's best for you. And if becoming Jewish means that you can't, we can't get married, then I'm happy that you'll become Jewish. And I'm crying also on the other <laughs> thing because I don't know how to get out of this. <laughs> and... Um, so I see, okay, now I'm convinced that they really are sincere. So two, three days later, I... You let it go two, well, three days right, later? Oh I, call, I call her in. And so I've been looking into this, and I found a hatter. You can marry the girl. <laughs> wow. And what does Biyama's mother say about that now? <laughs> yeah, was she, was she, yeah, well, she, said, she said she hated me. <laughs> I was so mean to her. Oh, gosh. But we're, we're like family, man. Right. That much like my children. I, I, wow. this, it's, it's like my gra- grandchildren. I thought you were saying yeah. two to three minutes later, two to three days <laughs> no, later. This, we, we, I meant beginning, like you were one of the first guests we wanted to have. I mean, Yaman was the person, my go-to, because I know how close your, his family is to you and your wife. And uh, wow, that's a really beautiful story. Wow. Wow. Rabbi Left, thank you so much for, for taking the time and joining us. It was us. a pleasure. I'm sure everyone's going to be very inspired by your story. And if anyone's looking to convert, uh, Rabbi <laughs> Left. I've been sitting here for an hour plus waiting for you to finish this episode. So I'm glad that you actually got through the whole thing. Uh, for those who it took three, four days, I'm starving <laughs> and I'm thirsty. So we're going to do this really quickly. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Do you think, mo- I'm curious for everyone, maybe we'll do a poll on Instagram. Do you listen to meaningful people do you listen to the full episode or you listen to it in like bite sizes how do you listen to podcasts i i generally unless i'm driving somewhere far and i'm able to tackle a full podcast i generally will listen to it throughout my day on on small commutes i'm driving 15 minutes there 20 minutes there and it could sometimes take me a day or two to finish one episode of a podcast but it also takes me nine weeks to finish a book um, it's, it's, it's always it's funny. shout out by Shevkin. It's always interesting. Except ten Shabbosim to finish a book. <laughs> it's always interesting how people they tell me like, oh, I listened to it last night. I'm like, you just came out. I'm like, where'd you listen? I, like, I was on my couch. I'm, I'm like, I a, maybe I'm not a 
person. Maybe I don't like. I don't understand people who just sit at home listening to podcasts. Well, I know. I I don't know why someone would listen to a podcast not in their car. I mean, I I I, I totally I'm game for it. I want people to listen to it. No, just different types. I think I'm. How just many of too, you are in your car right now? Yeah, I think there's a lot of people in their car. I always wonder when if self-driving cars become a thing will, will audio podcasts not be as popular because no. now all of a sudden people can know. watch stuff I don't know I don't know but either way thank you for listening thank you for watching get ready for next week we have another episode yes that is true or not <laughs> get ready oh you want me to end off with a catchphrase is that what you're waiting for I can give you one I'm like 17 you want a catchphrase what do you think of that you could try again. okay you rate it one to ten. Okay? I'm the Simon Cowell of your characters. <laughs> rate it one to ten. Okay. Thank you for listening to Meaningful People podcast. I'm Yaku Linger. I'm Naki Gordon. And don't forget, we want to have you on this podcast one day. Okay. I would give you a zero. What? But a zero out of zero 10? is not allowed. I feel like you were going to so say zero I will no give matter you what. A one. Okay. Very funny. <laughs> very cute. Anyways, that was a terrible catchphrase. So you put it that zero out of ten. I put that. I'll give you a one okay. just because you had a voice come in. Okay. Here, so then, know. then next week it's gonna well, at least aim for a two. Aim for a two. Also, by the way, it's like kind of a rookie rating system. A one. It's not like a point eight or like one point three. Pretty stable guy. Okay. Fine. Okay. One. One out of ten. All right, guys. Submit your catchphrases to our Instagram. Beep. Our Instagram. Our Instagram. Yeah. Meaningful you can go to yeah. Meaningful people blogs on that, and you can submit it there. Thank you. Ciao.